Hi guys, welcome to my channel NTWiz and welcome to the second video in administrative law. You would recall in our first video we answered the question is judicial review and there were a couple questions we needed to under that uh, general question we needed to address in terms of determining whether or not judicial, is re judicial review or JR is available. We are now at that second general question which is what are the grounds for JR? Now, ultimately, when you're having a discussion on grounds, you are going to get to one of two grounds, which is substantive error or procedural error. The question is, what informs? I will tell you. The Federal Court Act, as it relates to federal administrative body, um, provides those considerations that are to be looked into as it relates to um, what grounds are available for judicial review. And some of those considerations pursuant to the Federal Courts Act for administrative bodies that are established federally are failure to observe the principles of natural justice or procedural fairness and issues involving jurisdiction, which is without, beyond, or refusal to exercise jurisdiction and an error in law in making a decision. Now, when you have those considerations, it leads into what grounds you need to uh, embark upon in terms of pursuing judicial review. I will tell you, whenever there is a failure to observe the principles of natural justice, you are leaning towards um, process and you're leaning towards procedural error. When you have jurisdictional issues as it relates to making a decision, you are leaning towards a substantive error. Now, that is as it relates to federal court, the Federal Courts Act, and the federally formed uh, administrative bodies. When you're dealing with the considerations for common law in terms of determining the grounds for judicial review, you have these considerations, which would be error of fact, error of law, error of law and fact, and misuse of discretion. <clears throat> Now, what I will tell you is that those are considerations that can go either way in terms of procedural error or substantive uh, error. Usually, when you have a misuse of discretion, it usually leads towards a substantive error, but it's not exclusive, just like an error in fact, an error in law, an error in fact and law is not exclusive to procedural error or substantive error. Now, the question is, what do I do when I have an exam and I have to make or consider these, um, these contemplations or consider these considerations or look at these considerations in terms of getting to a ground. I will tell you most of the fact patterns that I've seen, um, it is a clear path in terms of whether or not it's a substantive error or a uh, procedural error. It helps to say that if you are dealing with a federally in, uh, established administrative body, again, remember, my approach to doing an exam is to show the examiner that you're competent. And yes, some of you want the bare minimum and you want to go, that's fine. You can say from the looks of things or from the fact pattern, it leads into procedural error, it leads into substantive error. That's fine. But if you want to say that this is a federally formed uh, administrative body and what informs the, the, the discussion about grounds would be the Federal Courts Act. And in terms of the discussion, it appears to be a ju jurisdictional issue, and therefore it would lean towards a substantive error. The examiner will be impressed. Or it seems to be leaning towards an issue of um, observing or failure to observe the principles of natural justice or procedural fairness. Therefore, there is a procedural error. If you're answering a question as it relates to common law, judicial review, and what grounds um, is to be established or which grounds you will pursue, you have a discussion. Well, this seems to be a misuse of discretion. So it informs the substantive uh, decision making process or it informs the procedural error. Even if it is already clearly established that you're going to procedural error, you know, just show the examiner that you, you are aware of the consideration in terms of granting leave for judicial review as that which will be considered by the courts. Now, I wouldn't say any more to that. All I will tell you is that I've also provided the link for the Nova Scotia Barrister Society notes, which I'm, I'm so grateful that they have supplied this notes because I use this notes for my exam. I provided the link below. And if you look at page seven, the discussion which I'm talking about is in the, on that page. 
Now we will move on to the third ground because now we are leaning towards procedural error. So now we need to establish whether or not procedural fairness is to be considered. So this is now the third question we've answered. Is judicial review available? What grounds? We are now performing a procedural fairness analysis because we have determined that procedural error seem to be the grounds that we will be pursuing. We now need to look into whether or not procedural fairness or do an analysis as it relates to procedural fairness. Now, where we are at this point is we are now considering whether or not we have crossed the threshold so that procedural or so that JR will be the next step. Remember, we are at the process when we're asking the questions whether or not JR is available and what grounds, we are actually seeking for leave for judicial review. We are at the stage now when we are making a determination in terms of presenting our argument for judicial review. And this, in this instant, we will now be performing a procedural fairness analysis. Now, one of the first grounds that you need to cross is the common law threshold. Now, the question that is going to be asked at the common law threshold is, is this kind of decision where the court should get involved to review procedures? So remember, we have determined whether or not JR is available. We have determined the grounds. We are saying from the facts and from our analysis and the contemplations of that which is we needed to consider as it relates to the grounds, we are leaning towards procedural error. So now we are asking the question, is this a kind of decision where the court should get involved in reviewing the procedure? <clears throat> now, there's a case called Nicholson v. Haldeman hyphen Norkford Regional Board of Commissioner of Police. Now, that case is very present in the notes <clears throat> that I have provided, or not the notes rather, but the um, discussion or the administrative law uh, discussion that uh, I provided a link for from the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Most of the cases that I've cited or are going to be cited will be coming from, from this notes. And if you look at page eight at the bottom, you would see common law threshold for procedural review. That is where we are in terms of our discussion. So the case Nicholson asked the question, duty of fairness should be applied. So where there is duty of fairness that should be applied, then the courts should get involved and have a discussion about uh, procedural fairness. So we need to, whenever we're talking about, you know, moving along, we've answered the question, is judicial review available? We've answered the question, what, um, what are the grounds? We are in procedural error. We are now doing a procedural fairness analysis. And then we're asking the question, you know, whether or not we can pursue uh, the courts are willing to review procedures as per Nicholson. And now we're asking the question, what should the courts consider? Now, I will tell you there are six things the courts will consider. Now, six things. The first one is, is the decision a legislative or a general decision? Now, legislative slash general. Legislative means that when the question is being asked, is it a legislative decision? It usually is a decision of a minister, and that type of legislative decision usually is all-encompassing. It usually targets a particular group, or it targets generally a, the public. And therefore, when, when a decision is made, a legislative decision or a general decision, it usually is exempted from judicial review because the very nature of the legislation is to address and enforce policy issues that has um, been established by the party who's executing the legislation as it relates to winning an election. So these, this party has given was given the mandate to implement their policies through their legislation. So if they are making a decision that is legislatively or in general, 
therefore it is seen as a, a decision that is immune or not subjected to judicial review. So making a law or a broad general policy or a decision that is just affecting the general public and not an individual on the whole is immune from judicial review. Now there's some some discussions or some cases that you need to refer there. There's the case of AG Canada, the Inuit Tapersat of Canada, that's I-N-U-I-T-T-A-P-I-R-S-A-T -T -T of Canada, and the case of the Canadian Association of Regulated Importer v. Canada AG. Those two cases were cases where the minister made general decisions and therefore they did not cross the common law threshold. They were an, an exemption. They, they were, um, they kind of a, were, these decisions were immune from judicial review. However, there was a case of Homex Real Realty v. Wyoming. And in that case, there was a decision that affected an individual. And therefore that did cross the threshold, the common law threshold. And that decision was seen as not an exception because it affected the individuals. Again, I ask you to go to the Nova Scotia notes. Um, that is the source, I can't say it again, that's the source of my information. That is actually page nine. Most of those cases are there. Now, the second question you need to answer, ask in terms of consider, in terms of what the courts are considering is, does the decision affect the rights interest, property, privileges, or liberty of the person being affected. Now, if that is a yes, then it crosses the threshold of common law, and therefore, GR is available. Now, for that, I want you to see the case of Martineau v. Matsuki Inmate Disciplinary Board. And again, that is on page 9 and 10 of the notes that I provided as it relates to that which is from the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. I'm giving them their due credit because it's an excellent read. Now, those are two considerations that we have mentioned as it relates to one and two. One being is the decision um, legislative or general, that being an exception, immune from GR, if it's general. If it's individual, as per the case of Homex, then it is subjected to judicial review because it would have crossed the common law threshold. The next question we ask is, does it infringe <coughs> on rights, interests, liberty, property, privileges? And if it does, then it crosses the common law threshold. I cited the case of Martineau. Now, the next three considerations by the courts uh, from a case called, and this is a very important case because this case is the Knight three-prong test case. Now, the Knight v. Indian Head School Division, and again, that's on page 10. And that case is where, that's a very important case when you're doing a procedural fairness analysis and when you're doing the common law consideration or whether or not the, the matter crosses the common law threshold. Now, the three questions that I'll do one at a time, the first question that comes out of the Knight's case is, does the decision have serious consequences? Now, depending on how the importance of the decision on the individual, the more likely in terms of it being <clears throat> more serious, the more likely it is to cross the threshold. So serious decisions versus trivial um, decisions or trivial um, consequences, the, the fact that it leans more towards a serious consequence, that would mean that it would have been uh, capable of crossing the common law threshold. That's the first limb of the three-prong test of night, the night case. The second is the decision final. Again, that is the second consideration of the three-prong test of night, the night case. And if the decision is final, it may lean more towards a, a crossing the common law threshold and therefore lean more towards um, judicial review. <clears throat> Now, this is in, when you're considering a final decision, it is considered in, um, as in comparison to a decision that is, you know, uh, preliminary or it is premature. Now, the final uh, limb of the three prong test as per night is, is what is the relationship between the administrative body and the individual? Now, this is 
kind of important for you under, to understand because it is important to understand the relationship. And this is where it can get tricky because if it's under, for example, um, a contract of employment and that relationship existed between the parties um, and that that relationship is of contract law, a contract, it suggests that there is no need for procedural fairness. It suggests that it is in accordance with the contract. So if there's an employment contract or contract of employment, under this third limb, the relationship, when you're asking and deliberating on that, you ask, what is the relationship between the affected party and the administrative body? And if it's an employee-employer situation and there is the existence of an employment contract, you would have to, you know, remove judicial review as an option and you may have to exercise the remedy of contract law. <clears throat> the other consideration is, <clears throat> has the relationship been established under the statute? Now, usually if the relationship is established under statute, for example, through regulations, you know, there was the appointment, um, usually procedural fairness will be required. Now, if it is at pleasure, which means that the Crown or the state has appointed at, appointed a person to stand, to sit on a board as a chairman or sit on, as a member, and uh, that person was part of a sub subcommittee and made a decision, and that appointment is at pleasure, usually it will be sub subjected to JR. Now, uh, in, in terms of this third limb of night, when remember night case has three limbs, does the decision, does the decision have serious consequences? Is the decision final? And what is the relationship between the administrative body and the individual? And we need to establish what types of what type of relationship we have established that if it's a private contract or an employment contract, it is not subjected to procedural fairness. If it's under statute or at pleasure, which means through appointment by a state or through statute, the appointment has been made um, and therefore the relationship exists between the state and probably the, the individual. Therefore, it suggests that it is that the relationship is subjected to some degree of procedural fairness. Now, with regard to the case of under statute, you need to see the case of Knight. Um, and under contract, actually, that case, if I do recall the Knight case, it was an individual who was actually under an employment contract and therefore was not subjected to procedural fairness. If it was appointment under statute per Knight, it is required to, to be subjected to procedural fairness. If it's at pleasure, as in the case of Dunsmere, to further support the Knight case, and Dunsmere, not, we're not having a discussion about standard of review, so don't jump at me and say, well, sir, that case has been repealed. It has been repealed as it relates to the discussion of standard of review. But as it relates to procedural fairness at pleasure, it is a case that you can cite as it relates to that which requires procedural fairness. Now, I mentioned to you what, what the courts consider in terms of common law, crossing the common law threshold as it relates to procedural fairness um, anal uh, analysis. Now, the sixth consideration is whether or not these decisions are made as a result of emergencies. Now, under the pandemic, a few decisions were made under an emergency state. What happened recently in Ottawa was a decision made under the Emergency Act. Classic example, those decisions are not subjected or cannot cross the common law threshold. So what we have done is we have had, we are talking about whether or not um, in terms of performing the procedure of fairness, whether or not the common law threshold has been crossed. We have suggested that the courts ask the question whether or not duty of fairness is required per the Nicholson case. You start by saying, if it's yes, then you lead into the six considerations of the court. You ask if the, the decision is a le legislative decision. You ask whether or not rights privilege has been infringed. And then you move to the three-pronged test as it relates to the night case, as it relates to seriousness of the decision, final decision, and relationship. And then you move on to emergencies. In a nutshell, of those six considerations, three comes from night, the night case, the three-pronged test. Two are exceptions, legislative decisions, and emergencies. And one 
basically stands alone as it relates to crossing the or infringing the rights and privileges of an individual, just so that you could remember it easily. Now, what I will tell you, and we're coming to the end of the common law threshold, what I will tell you is that even though you've performed your common law threshold, and let's say it has not crossed the common law threshold in terms of your analysis, and you need to ask a final question. And the final question is, and I have this which I would like to read to you, even if the common law threshold has not been crossed in consideration of the above, the above six considerations, the courts may impose certain procedures on the administrative body where a party has a legitimate expectation of procedural rights based on a promise of, public, of a public official or past practice of the administrative body. That is almost like your last line that you will put at the end of your common law threshold analysis. Now, um, the case for that is the All St. Boniface Residence Association, Inc. versus Winnipeg City. Again, that case is available in page 11 of those fine notes by the Nova Scotia Barrister Society regarding administrative law. Now, asking that question, after performing the analysis, and if there's a legitimate expectation, if the fact pattern suggests that as a public official, he is expected to have, he does a legitimate, legitimate expectation of procedural fairness <clears throat> or based on past practice, it, and usually they say previously this has been done, previously this was done, you can cite the case of all St. Boniface and says, even though it has not crossed the common law threshold, <clears throat> Based on legitimate expectation, I will be making an application or my argument will be based on legitimate expectation um, where I will um, seek my judicial review. That is at the point where you would move forward in terms of the legitimate expectation. So what have we done? We have started the procedural um, fairness analysis. We have made a determination that judicial review is available. We have answered the question as it relates to the ground. We have leaned more to procedural error. As an example, moving forward, we will then discuss substantive error, but procedural error. And now we have just performed or started the uh, procedure of fairness analysis. And we have started by um, conducting the first limb, which is the common law threshold. Now, I will tell you, and I will just introduce the next topic because I'm coming to an end of this, with this video, or coming an end to this video. As it relates to procedural fairness analysis, we have um, conducted the common law threshold. We have brought in the Nicholson case. We have brought in the ministerial decision. Remember those decisions as it relates to Homex, general, and um, individual. We have spoken about the three-prong night test. We have spoken about the exceptions. We have spoken about the legitimate expectations. That is your common law threshold analysis discussion in a nutshell. Please remember to cite the Knight case. That's very, very important as it relates to the three-pronged test. Sometimes I've seen fact patterns where they put a ministerial decision in there just to confuse you. You need to ask the question, is it addressing an individual issue or is it addressing a general issue that provides an exception for GR to the minister to the administrative body. So this brings us an end to this video. The next subtopic that we will have under procedure of fairness analysis, we'll continue with that, would be uh, the constitutional threshold. If you like this video, please subscribe. Don't forget to uh, like and recommend. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.